Hi again, and welcome to another three-part series, this time covering linear classification. If you didn't watch my previous three-part series on linear regression, you might want to check it out, unless you're already comfortable with linear regression. To set the stage for the rest of the series, here's the notation that I use throughout my slides. It's pretty consistent with the notation used by Christopher Bishop in his book, but there are a few slight deviances. For example, I represent vectors as uppercase letters and matrices as uppercase and bold letters. Everything else should be consistent with the notation that Bishop uses. You may be asking yourself, where do you learn about linear regression? How is it that different from linear classification? Well, in regression, we're trying to calculate or approximate an output that is a continuous variable. Examples of this include calculating temperature or pressure given a set of variables, or the concentration of chemicals in a solution. The output can be a continuum of possible values. In classification, we're trying to put each output into a class or a group. One example of this would be trying to classify a type of iris flower using the length and width of petals of the flower and determining if it is one of three types of iris. For example, iris setosa, iris virginica, and iris versicolor. Here's another example of the classification problem as seen with EMG data. Here we have two electrodes attached to the skin on the dorsal and the ventral side of an appendage such as, I don't know, the lower arm or the upper arm or the lower leg. Anyway, with this data, we're trying to classify the continuous signals we get from the sensors into one of four actions for the appendage. That is, whether it's rest, flexion, extension, or co-contraction. When we graph the data, data points into 2D space, we happen to see a nice separation with this data set. We could then use a method called zero-one loss. This is also known as the misclassification error. To help us minimize the data points that we are classifying incorrectly and maximize those that we're classifying correctly. While this is a straightforward method, it happens to be non-convex and NP-hard to optimize. Unlike the maximum likelihood methods we talked about in the linear regression lectures, 0, 1 is, a, is robust to outliers. And since we aren't just interested in classifying our data set, usually we're interested in classifying future samples as well, this means that we need to find a method that generalizes the boundaries for our classes. But how do we define the boundaries of where classes start and stop? Isn't there an infinite number of lines that you can draw between two data points? To determine whether X is a member of class 0 or class 1, for example, we just see what side of the line it's on. We use the term hyperplane to generalize the idea of a line to more than one dimension. In machine learning, you can use hyperplanes that are easily a thousand dimensions or larger. The interesting thing about this high dimensional space is that most of our intuitions about how the data looks comes from three dimensional space. And a lot of these intuitions turn out to be completely wrong in high dimensional space. For example, well, I have an example I could give you, but I'm getting a little off track. So here we have a simple example of what I'm talking about. We have an equation for a line for with which by this point, we should be fairly familiar. The vector x are our data points, and w is a vector of weights, with b being our uh, offset point. Previously, we had modif we'd shown b as w0, but it can also be in this form. What's great about hyperplanes is that they are very easy to evaluate. So they don't use a whole lot of computational resources. 
okay, well, yeah, that's great and all. But what if we have data that can't be separated so cleanly as we saw with the EMG data? Well, that brings us to the definition of linear separability. Essentially, a data set is called linearly separable if there exists a hyperplane or a set of hyperplanes where all of the classes are correctly classified. One historical method that takes advantage of both zero-one loss and the notion of a linear, linear separating hyperplane is the perceptron algorithm from Rosenblatt. The way it functions should make intuitive sense. Essentially, it has a separating hyperplane defined by the function w transpose times x plus the offset b. Again, b can just be thought of as w0 that we denoted earlier in the linear regression lectures. The function f is a simple step function that makes the decision whether the point is in class 0 or class 1. So how do we train the perceptron to learn where to place the hyperplane? This was the problem that we had discussed before. We don't know how to solve. Well, let's start out with a randomly initialized vector for w. Then, while we still have misclassified data points resulting from the current state of our algorithm, we use this updating rule. For each misclassified point, we remove the value of that point's coordinates from the weight vector if the point is supposed to belong to class 0, and we add the point's coordinates to the weight vector if the point for the class is class 1. It doesn't matter if we switch between classes. If the switch would... Let me say, it doesn't matter if we switch which classes get added and subtracted in this two-class case, as long as we are consistent. OK, so that covers the learning rule for the weight vector. But what about the bias? Here you can see a similar learning rule for the bias. But here, we are adding or subtracting 1 in a matter similar to before. What's nice about this algorithm is that it's guaranteed to converge for the two-class case, as long as the classes are linearly separable. But note that this doesn't say anything about convergence to the optimal solution. This algorithm only converges, or only guarantees that the training points that we have seen will be separated correctly. It doesn't make any guarantees about future points. We should also remember that there are a infinite number of lines that can be drawn between two linearly separable points. For example, if I have point here and a point here, all of these are valid separating lines. So the space that we have to search is very large if we don't make some cer certain assumptions about what's happening. We'll come back to these issues later. So how do you think we could scale up the idea behind this algorithm to multiple classes? Let's say we have three classes we'd like to separate. I'll just make three simple classes. Well. Since we only need two lines to separate three points, we should only need two hyperplanes to separate three linearly separable classes, right? So we have a line that separates class one from the other two classes. And we have a line that separates class two from the other two classes. And now, everything should be classified correctly, right? We can classify this space as the negative of this line and this line, this space as the negative of this line, uh, and the negative of this line, or sorry, the, the positive of this line and the negative of this line, and this group as the positive of this line and the negative of this line. So everything looks good, right? Well, 
as you can see, it creates an area of space that doesn't belong to any of the classes. Hmm. Okay. I guess that approach doesn't work so well. Okay. I got it figured out. If we have three distinct, three discriminant functions, then one for each class, that should fix things, right? So we have class here. We have our class here. We have this class again over here. And we have a line to separate this one, this class, from these two classes. We have a line to separate this class from these two classes. And now we have a line to separate this class from these two classes. That should fix everything, right? Ah, crap. That doesn't look good either. Well, it turns out that this problem is because we're framing the idea in terms of binary problems. Okay, instead of focusing on a binary problem, Let's write it as a set of k linear functions, one for each class. Here, the, su the sub k is the index for each class. The equation separates that class from all other classes, as we saw in the previous examples. And it's chosen when the y function for that sub k is greater than all the other um, linear functions in the set where k is not equal to j. What this gives us is a decision boundary where y sub k is equal to y sub j. When we formulate the problem in this manner, we get a solution that is simply connected and convex. Now, I should make the disclaimer that this method makes the huge assumption that the data is linearly separable. So how do we deal with the problem that the assumption is covering up? Essentially, we're asking about what happens when the data is not linearly separable. This is just a fancy way of saying, what if our classes cannot be separated cleanly by normal straight lines? in that space. And when I mean cleanly, I mean all of the points for every class are on the correct side of a separating hyperplane. So what do you do when data isn't linearly separable with a simple W transpose X plus B equation that we talked about before? Well, if you remember back to the lecture on linear regression, what we can do with an algorithm that is in the wx plus b form is, come on, what can we do? Yes, exactly. We can introduce a basis function over the x. Basis functions are helpful if we have data like you see below. In theory, you'd know the correct basis function to create or use that would work perfectly for your task. In reality, you have to try a few that you're familiar with in order to get a feel for what the data might look like. Because remember, the data that we're playing with is probably not two-dimension or three-dimension data. It's hundred or thousand-dimension data. In the later lectures, we will cover ways to automatically learn the best basis functions to use to classify the data. But today, we're going to stick with common functions. For example, what's an example of a basis function that would work to correctly classify this data that you see here? It's obvious that a simple linear classifier is not going to work. So what do you do? Here's one way of doing it. We create a basis function that transforms our coordinates into polar coordinates. Now we can easily classify the data because in the polar domain, the data points are linearly separable. Let's look at another example. Here we can see a basis function transformation that takes our data points x1 and x2 and puts them into three dimensions. From here, 
we can easily separate the data with a, linearly, with a linear hyperplane. So let's assume that we're able to find the perfect basis function that splits the data with least amount of error. We're still not guaranteed that the data is perfectly separable. So how do we minimize our error in these sorts of situations? Obviously, our first approach is the good old least squares function. You should remember this from the linear regression lectures. The only real difference here is that we've replaced some of the vectors with matrices. We have the function y. That's our approximation of the true underlying function. Our error function for our training set d is shown by equation 1. If we set the derivative of the error function with respect to w to 0 and we rearrange, we get the optimal solution for w which is the pseudo-inverse, or the more penrose pseudo-inverse, of x multiplied by z. We can then plug this back into y, and we get, now we have a discriminant of the form that we see in equation 3. If this doesn't ring any bells, definitely check out my lecture on basic linear regression. So one of the cool things about the least squares solution with multiple classes is that as long as the target vectors satisfy some linear constraint, then the predictions that y makes will also satisfy that constraint. Um, okay, how is that useful? Well, it means that if we use a one of k coding scheme for k classes, then the elements of y of x will sum to 1 for any value of x. But before you think, awesome, now I don't have to use now I can use them as probabilities, just wait a second. The values of the model are not constrained to lie between 0 and 1. So we can't quite interpret them as probabilities. Like in regression, the least square approach gives us a closed form solution for the discriminant parameters. But also, like in regression, it has severe problems with outliers. The graphs here show a great example of how least squares can punish data points that happen to be too correct. The magenta line on the graph shows how the least squares discriminant changes when new data is added that happens to be correct, but very far from the discriminant line. See how much it influences the line? In contrast, the green line shows logistic regression, which is able to handle the outlying points in a much nicer fashion. We'll cover logistic regression in a future lecture. So we can also think of creating a discriminant function through the idea of dimensionality reduction. The simple approach would be to pick, pick a dimension that connects the means of two classes and then project those classes down to that dimension. Well, obviously this isn't a great option because we have lots of overlap between the classes. A better approach would be to find the dimension in which the classes have the most separation and then project the classes to the lower dimension where you can use a decision rule to separate them. One algorithm that does precisely this approach is known as the Fisher criterion and it is used to create Fisher's linear discriminant. Equation 4 is the Fisher criterion. It's essentially a ratio of the between class variance and the within class variance. What does that mean? Well, if we have two distributions, the between class variance is this, and the within class variance is this. So we want to maximize the separation between classes and minimize 
the variance within a class. So, the criterion does exactly this. We can see this better if we rewrite equation 4 as equation 5. As I mentioned earlier, there are lots of different types of discriminant functions that can be chosen for any problem. The approach of directly mapping input data to a class label with no probabilities involved makes computation very quick and efficient, but it leaves quite a bit to be desired when using this sort of approach on data that is not able to be visualized. For example, data with a 100 dimension vector, vector that isn't linearly separable. Luckily, there are more powerful but also more complex approaches available. So stepping up from linear discriminant functions, we have discriminant models. These probabilistic models try to model the posterior class probabilities directly and then assign each new data point to a class based on whether the dis whatever decision function they've chosen. If you move up even more in complexity, another approach is to model the posterior class probabilities, but instead of just modeling the posterior, this approach models the prior and the likelihood so that the posterior can be determined for each class individually. Then a decision function, again, decides class membership. The difference between discriminative models and generative models can be confusing at first glance. Here's another way to think of how the models function. With generative models, we try to approximate the classes by finding the prior and likelihood for each class. This allows us to generate samples from those classes as if they were data points. This is contrasted with the method of discriminative models that you should be familiar with already where we have the data points and we try to infer the classes. The next two lectures in this series will cover these two types of models in more depth. Thanks for watching and have a great day.